Hi. Igor, I see you've joined us. How are you, sir? Doing great. Hi, yeah. Awesome. Uh, for those of you uh, who are attending the conference, again, like we've seen all the way through the day, if you have a question, please post it in the questions and answers for Igor, and we will address it after his presentation. Uh, Igor, I'm going to jump out of your way and I'll let you kick into it. Good luck. Thank you so much, Andrew. Let me share my screen. All right. So yeah, I'm Igor, uh, working at SmartCat as a senior product manager, and today we'll be talking about multilingual content delivery at scale. And before we start, uh, an announcement. The best question today, uh, after my presentation, we'll get a book about global marketing. This is a pretty new book, and uh, it covers lots of different aspects of creating, uh, like, like creating multilingual websites, which kind of like complements the talk that we'll be uh, discussing today. Now, why are we picking that topic uh, this time around? Well, we see certain trends uh, and we uh, have clients that are coming to us and ask us those questions on how to implement proper scalable process for delivering multilingual websites, blogs, etc. And they are coming from different directions. One of the recent trends that we saw is that we have uh, lots of garment clients that are coming to us and um, because of uh, like COVID related content, because of uh, having a need, sometimes a legal need to deliver multilingual websites uh, as like uh, for emergency response programs, etc., they understand that their current uh, processes are outdated and they cannot cope with the pace at which they are creating the content. Sometimes they have to update a certain page on the website multiple times a day with some new updated information. They want to deliver that in multiple languages. We also see that software companies, they kind of like cracked the, uh, the idea of continuous localization uh, for their products. They, they do fast product delivery cycles and they enjoy using continuous localization for that. But at the same time, they see that their marketing content uh, is a little bit um, like not on par with the same speed and ease of uh, continuous localization that they have for software. So they are asking us if there's anything can be done to do the same kind of thing for marketing content, for technical documentation, for health center articles, etc. And the third thing is that uh, machine translation is getting better, uh, not every year, but every quarter and every month. Uh, to the extent that clients are usually happy to use machine translation um, and um, they want to pre-translate everything with machine translation, publish their website or specifically like if we're talking about technical documentation, help center articles, they want to pre-translate them using machine translation and they buy into the idea that machine translation can give them this uh, near uh, uh, real-time uh, content delivery experience, but at the same time, their technologies and the processes they use do not allow them to tap into that, in it, into its full potential. So how can we solve the problem of really scalable multilingual content delivery? There are two uh, key things that I'll be uh, demonstrating and discussing today. Uh, the first is uh, continuous localization. A, an approach to content delivery that allows you to uh, create that next level of automation. And then we'll be talking about uh, more efficient machine translation and machine translation post-editing uh, scenarios. Uh, there are more things to think about when we're talking about automating and scaling your operations. And if we have time at the end, I will be covering uh, three uh, items, uh, last items on that list as well. But first of all, let's talk about content delivery. Uh, ultimately, this is the main, um, like the main area where you can apply your efforts to implement a much better, much scalable uh, content delivery uh, in multiple uh, languages. And if we're talking about continuous localization, and that's something that I was uh, talking about in the past in my previous presentations, the conferences, the problem with uh, the definition of continuous localization is that that definition doesn't really exist. And many companies, both from the buyer side and from the vendor side, when they're talking about continuous localization, they can be talking about completely different things. And that's a problem because 
if you are shopping for a translation management solution and uh, or you're uh, talking to different vendors and they say, yes, we are offering you continuous localization because it's a common buzzword these days, you do not really know how to compare those things and how to understand that what they offer will be actually truly scalable. So uh, I googled around and found a few kind of like definitions or something that resembles the definition of continuous localization. And none of them are really great. Uh, some of them are not real definitions at all. Uh, if, like, uh, continuous localization is a process that relies on automation to accelerate the sequence of steps involving in producing professional translation. It just says that continuous localization uh, kind of like a better automation, but it doesn't give you a definition of how to distinguish continuous localization from any sort of other automation, if you will. Uh, some say that continuous localization is a best practice for integrating translation into software development. Again, uh, it focuses on software uh, and just says that uh, continuous localization is something that is good, but what is continuous localization in the first place? Uh, the, the third one is, uh, is a definition. Uh, no, sir, I'm, very, I'm very sorry for interrupting, but few people complaining that the volume is very low. Actually, I can hear you perfectly, but we have like several complaints in the chat already. So if you can somehow, okay. I don't know, I think increase I think the volume. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Uh, is it better now? Say something. Well, let's see that if chat says, yeah, chat says yes. Great, thanks. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a couple of microphones. I guess I was not using the right one. So, uh, the third one is uh, says continuous localization is a localization of software that is developed using agile methodology. It looks like a definition. It's pretty precise and explains what continuous localization is. The problem is that it's really narrow-minded. It makes you think that continuous localization is only about localizing software, and it prevents you from thinking out of the box. So uh, I would like to propose my own definition, the way uh, I believe in that, the way we are thinking about it on, in, in SmartCat and uh, the way we're trying to build processes around like when uh, implementing things related to continuous localization. Uh, continuous localization is a process where source content is autonomously gathered and published for translation in its entirety. And where translated content is autonomously published or integrated into the product without artificial delays. So I put uh, emphasis in a couple of places here because they uh, can be a real good litmus test when you are uh, thinking about continuous localization and trying to compare different automation methods and approaches and technologies uh, because it will, if you can see that a continuous localization process as it is uh, like presented uh, to you by you know, like a vendor, a technology vendor, et cetera, uh, does those sorts of things that are uh, emphasized here, then you will have a process that will be really scalable. And I will try to explain this in further slides. Now, here's the sad truth about uh, the connectors and the current state of technologies. Uh, when we're trying to make an, uh, a really scalable process for creating a multilingual website, we're thinking about connector. And connector is a sort of like magic thing that kind of solves that scalable problem for you. It makes everything simple and smooth. And if you have a connector, you are good to go. Now, the problem is that most connectors offered by uh, modern TMS cannot be used for continuous localization. And here's why. Now, let's look at the process, uh, like the, the typical process that you have with having a TMS and having a connector to your favorite content management system. So you have a content management system on the left, you have your translation management system on the right. In the content management system, you have some pages that you want to send over for translation. So what you do with the connector, you basically select those pages and then you create a translation job where you specify, here is my list of source language and my target languages, here's the deadline. Um, and then you are sending that over to a TMS. Uh, just a few clicks, uh, you know, looks pretty simple. Then you wait for the translation job to be uh, fully complete, and then you import the translations back. Now, the problem with that approach is uh, it basically mimics what you used to do without connectors in the first place. It resembles the manual approach that we all 
no and love or, or hate, depending on the volumes that you are translating. So without connector, what you would be doing is like copy pasting the content into like a Word document, sending that over by email to a vendor, then get the translations from them back, then copy paste them into your CMS. That's the manual uh, process. Connectors automate that to a certain extent. They uh, reduce uh, human error. You don't need to copy paste things. You just like select things in a nice UI and then send them over for translation. But it's still largely a somewhat automated manual process uh, that uses the same job-based approaches. And why, um, why it's not scalable? Well, it works well enough if you want to send some new content for translation um, I don't know, once, uh, like every week or twice a week. But what if you want to do this every day or every hour? The problem with that, you will have uh, lots of things to do in order for this to happen. And on the TMS side, you will have lots of small fragmented jobs to handle. And those small fragmented jobs uh, are really hard to deal with on both sides. As a uh, localization manager, if you have too many small jobs to handle, again, it becomes uh, like logistic nightmare to, to handle all of those. Uh, if you are a linguist and you get some small uh, translations to complete, some translation jobs to complete, again, you do not understand what you are actually doing. A translation job can be one document, a couple of documents, and can be even just a few strings that need to be translated. So how do you deal with that? And um, how do you understand what you're translating? Now, if you're trying, again, if you're trying to speed it up, you will see that you have this uh, scalability ceiling uh, and you cannot simply like do this uh, fully automatically. If you want to really automate the process and not have to click any buttons to create those jobs, you want to automate that part as well. Uh, you still will be waiting for uh, some new content to be uh, accumulated on the CMS side so that the like new content uh, drop or a new job will have substantial size, if you will, so it could be manageable. Uh, during our uh, last log from home uh, back in May, uh, we had Rebecca Ray from CSA Research and uh, she presented a new paper that they, uh, that they uh, like assembled uh, that is called continuous localization at warp speed. So uh, it really uh, highlights the kind of like the state of the art and state of the mind of the industry uh, when it comes to all things related to automation and continuous localization. And one of the things was uh, she had an interactive poll where uh, all the attendees uh, tried to answer the, uh, the question, what was their number one challenge related to continuous localization? So besides, uh, just not knowing where to start, which was the first, like most popular uh, answer. The second one was balancing continuous localization. So the speed and quality it produces. And then in the paper itself, uh, Rebecca Ray says, uh, I quote that several interviewees expressed frustration and reservations about how continuous localization affects linguistic quality. Rapid and frequent drops of content with zero contextual information to guide linguists is typical under the model. So uh, it looks exactly like what we saw here in the previous slide, right? So as you try to implement this continuous localization uh, in a wrong way, uh, based on like job-based approach, you will have this fragmentation. Uh, you will have much less context uh, as if you were translating a, like the entirety of the content, uh, the entire website at once. So uh, the quality will really suffer and you cannot really scale that. So um, you cannot do the, do the uh, new content drops every 15 minutes. Again, you will have more problems with that. Uh, and uh, trying to speed up things to give more lead time to linguists will actually lead to less quality, not more quality and more time to translate. So how can we deal with that? How can we make sure that we can have a proper scalable uh, approach and process uh, to localize websites without having those quality issues? And this is how a continuous localization process uh, looks like. Again, going back to the definition of continuous localization that I gave before, uh, one of the key things is that you want to synchronize all of the content that you have uh, in your CMS for translation and make it available in your TMS, uh, available for translation at all times. 
So here you have your CMS, you have your set of pages uh, or like objects that you need to translate. And you set up a connector that works as a two-way synchronization between your CMS and TMS. On a TMS side, instead of having multiple fragmented jobs, you have a single continuous translation project that exposes all of the strings for translation. And that uh, connector that does this two-way synchronization is responsible for synchronizing uh, the content between CMS and TMS and publishing all the strings for translation. Now, are there any uh, connectors that uh, use this exact approach? Well, that's something that we are building at SmartCat. And right now we have a few connectors that use exactly the same approach and we encourage you to try them and see how that approach would work for you. Um, and uh, a few of them like, like Google Docs or WordPress Contentful are really easy to integrate, uh, to set up and test uh, in your environment. What I want to show you here is how that looks like in the actual world. Like how does the connector work, uh, for example, with Google Docs? Here, what we see is, uh, for example, you have a Google Drive folder that you are uh, setting up in integration with. And in that folder, you have uh, two documents. So you want to localize them using this continuous localization approach. You do not press any buttons to make them appear on the TMS side. You set up the integration once, it will monitor this folder and all the subfolders and will expose all the documents for translation in the TMS. In the TMS, you see all the documents available for translation at all times. You do not change the project. The project stays there forever. And uh, usually what it needs to be, it needs to be like translated up to 100% at all times. But if you have something, uh, something new appearing, like new document or a new string, it will appear in that project as, uh, as, fully, as fully untranslated or like semi-translated, depends on uh, translation memory matches. So, if we open a uh, certain document in the source in English, it will look like that. And if you open the same document on a TMS side, you will see that it has all the content, all the headings and paragraphs, et cetera, available for translation. Here I'm providing the translation, uh, like machine translated content um, for this example. So once the document is translated, the same process that synchronizes your CMS and TMS pushes changes back into your, um, into your content storage here. It's a Google Drive folder. And for all of the source documents, uh, it creates a folder, subfolder uh, with the same name, underscore translations, and contains uh, all the translated documents there. And if we go into a specific folder for one of the files, we see that it generated a Russian version of that document with uh, full, full formatting. Now, the beauty of this approach is that this process works behind the scenes uh, all the time, and it doesn't matter how fast or how slow it works. Like you can run it uh, every day, you can run it every hour, you can run it every minute. It will uh, still lead to uh, the same kind of view of your doc of your documents and your content on the TMS side. You don't have this fragmentation and you have full context of which, what you're translating. For example, if you want to change a, um, a word over here and uh, a content creator uh, goes into the document that just replaces that word with something else, the next time the connector detects this change, it, uh, that change will appear on the TMS side and here you will have a new segment that will need to be translated. If you are changing a typo or adding some new content, a new paragraph over here, again, what will be uh, available for you in a TMS, you will have a fully translated document that you already translated before. And between those fully translated segments, you will have a new segment that needs to be translated. So as a linguist goes and provides translation for all of the new stuff, they see all the past translations, they see the page in its entirety, they get all the context and they understand what they're doing. Now the same process monitors the translations and as the translations uh, are being uh, added initially or updated afterwards, they all are synchronized into the, uh, into the final document. Again, you don't have to click any buttons. The integration works behind the scenes. It can work as fast as you need to. And 
the faster it works, the more lead time it gives to your linguists. So you are not compromising the quality, the quality of life and like the quality of job of the linguists because they see all the content at once, but you are giving them much more lead time to, to actually provide quality translations. To, uh, let, let's summarize all the things that we discussed about traditional job-based approach to writing connectors and the ones that use this like true continuous localization uh, mode. The traditional job-based ones are manual by design. They work on the same principles that uh, you use to manually submit documents for translation. And continuous localization ones are uh, built with automation in mind. And because of that traditional job-based approach doesn't scale much. It allows you to simplify certain operations. It reduces some clicks. It reduces some human error. But at the end, uh, there's a limit on how fast you can do those, uh, like create those jobs because of fragmentation. Uh, the continuous localization approach really scales easily because no matter how often you run that uh, automation, you don't have that fragmentation in the first place. So fragmentation uh, leads to small jobs, to little context on the traditional side of things, and that leads to degrading quality. And with continuous localization, as I mentioned, uh, linguists always work in the context of full documents, uh, so they have no quality issues there. And lastly, the traditional job-based approach is really hard to combine with on-demand post-editing and machine translation post-editing. Um, while the continuous localization approach is uh, like really embraces this. And we'll be talking about uh, this specific item uh, in the next chapter. So how do you implement machine translation and efficient post-editing and selective post-editing um, using this continuous localization approach? There are different, first of all, as, as I mentioned probably before, machine translation is uh, quite go good enough these days so that uh, clients want to do uh, like blanket machine translation and uh, publish the machine translated content online for certain types of content, not probably for highly visible marketing, marketing websites, but for technical documentation, developer documentation, uh, help and learning articles, etc. cetera. Uh, and when it comes to traditional connectors and traditional uh, technologies, traditional translation management systems, it is relatively easy to implement this like blanket, uh, like 100% raw machine translation uh, process, or it is easy to implement 100% uh, machine translation post-editing approach because this is how you set up your, um, your workflows. You just say that everything goes through machine translation. You send anything into TMS, it gets like automatically translated using machine translation. You import things back and you are done. Uh, but when it comes to scaling the operations, or imagine that you want to have a hybrid model. You have a large website with lots of content to translate, and you want to do this machine translation. But for certain types of content, you still want to have this like post-editing capability. And it turns out that the traditional job-based approach are not that good in providing that sort of um, flexibility. Because what happens is that when you are done translating the job using machine translation, that translation job is closed. It's archived. You cannot amend that. Uh, you already can like paid for that. It's, it's a done deal. Now, what happens if you want to send just a specific page or a specific type of um, like paragraph or sentence for uh, revising? You cannot really easily do that unless you specify a like full page for translation and then uh, make it uh, make a translation job with different parameters so that it goes through a different type of process. And again, if you want to do this at scale, uh, it requires lots of uh, manual operations from the localization manager, so it doesn't doesn't really scale that much. When you are thinking about machine translation uh, process, you you need to understand how the overall process will look like with machine translation. And specifically, as I'm talking about selective post-editing, would it be possible to fix a particular translation? What steps you will need to do in order to, to do that? Um, will, uh, will that fix that you will be applying uh, for a particular translation uh, used in future translations? 
Uh, and if the selective post editing is available at all with uh, the current uh, type of connector and the platform that you are using. Since the selective post editing is really hard to implement uh, in this like job-based approach as I already discussed, um, what people, what we see the clients are usually doing in their, in their processes is that uh, once the translation is uh, machine translation is done, but they see that they need to post edit a certain string, what they usually do is they go into their CMS and edit the string there. And that becomes a much easier uh, thing for them instead of doing like this whole like round trip with another translation job and like sending over some instructions to the linguist that they need to pay attention to a particular sentence or whatever they just do the post editing right in the CMS. This feels like a natural thing to do, really easy, really, um, uh, yeah, really fast. But the problem is that this fix, uh, if, this, if it's done in the CMS side, it's not applied to a translation memory on the TMS side. Now, the next time they want to translate a similar page or similar sentence in the context of another page, the machine translated process, like blanket machine translation, will do the same kind of error uh, for that string. And they will need to reapply the fix in the CMS over and over again, as they will be dealing with lots of content. Again, not something that is really scalable uh, if you're talking about lots of, uh, lots of content. What's, uh, what, does the, uh, what does the continuous localization process bring here in terms of uh, improving the selective post editing capabilities? Well, uh, previously, and I'll probably go to one of those slides, uh, we, we see that uh, with the proper continuous localization approach where you see all of the uh, content available for you for translation at all times, you can do this uh, blanket uh, machine translation for all of the content that you get in the TMS, and that content will be automatically synchronized and published on your website by default. But since you have everything available for translation, you can see the current state of translation for every single sentence. What you can get is uh, if you want to fix a typo, if you want to change some term to something else, if you want to change a punctuation, whatever, you can just simply go to that project in your TMS, find a specific sentence in the file and change that. And that's it. And that change will be automatically propagated into the final document. So you don't again have to create translation jobs or do any additional clicks to make that synchronization happen. So with continuous localization implemented that way, it is possible for you to go back to any previously translated content and amend that and uh, improve that over time. And the important thing here is that you are not simply improving that content for that specific page and you are synchronizing that into your CMS, but you are also um, providing all those amendments, all those changes into your translation memory. So the next time you see a similar sentence appearing elsewhere, it will be using a revised translation that you provided before. Now, Sorry, if Igor, to just to jump in very yeah. quickly, uh, we've technically reached the end of your presentation time. I have a number of questions open, but if you want, I can give you a okay. couple of minutes just to wrap up, and then we'll jump into the uh, to the questions because there's quite a few coming in. Okay, okay, sounds good. So uh, I'll be quick here. Cool. So uh, there are, uh, and this is probably my, my last slide uh, anyway. So um, if you want to really implement this uh, selective post editing at scale, uh, there are certain ways to do that. And uh, for example, you can have a uh, full machine translation of the entire content, but then selectively translate most important content. And how do you define that most important content? There are a few ways to do that. Uh, first of all, you can implement some sort of voting widget on each of the page of your, um, of your website, which asks people to provide feedback on the quality of translation. If, and if you see that there is a signal that a particular page is translated uh, not in a way that people expect and they want to have a better translation, they can vote for that. And then can, uh, that can be a signal uh, for you to send a particular page for additional human review. Uh, you can use some traffic and like page popularity uh, as a signal. And if there's a certain number of visitors uh, visiting a specific help center article, then you want to spend your time and your budget on doing post editing for that page uh, specifically. 
And you can do this proactively if you know that there's uh, some important content going up and you want to uh, make sure you, you know that it will have lots of traffic, then you can do this as well uh, upfront without having for any signal. Um, so with that, I, I believe we can wrap up. Uh, those uh, other things are pretty minor. And again, um, there are more things for you to consider if you are trying to scale up, uh, scaling supply chain and project management sometimes is done with large LSPs that have enough capacity for you that to run any project, but you can also do this with the translation management system that allows you to tap into a marketplace of uh, freelancers and suppliers. You want to provide more context ideally automatically. You want to automatically publish whatever you're translating, at least in the staging environment of your website. So you can give that staging uh, staging website to your linguists, they can see the final result and then go back and amend the translations. That so, is awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. I, yes, sorry, man. I'm, I'm going to have to jump in because we have so many questions coming in for you. Um, would you mind um, removing this, or stop to stop sharing the slides for a moment? Um, yeah, absolutely. Kate, Kate has said people want to see us. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand how or why, but okay. Um, okay, so very, very quickly, um, the, the best question will be, given the book that you've nominated, The Language of Global Marketing, Translate Your Domestic Strategies into International Sales and Profits. Um, there was one question in there, which I will address very quickly. Yulia has asked, uh, will there be a video of this recording? And yes, there will be. All the presentations are being recorded, and they will be distributed by Kate and the SmartCat team uh, after, uh, I assume, in the next week. But yes, all of the presentations have been recorded and will be shared. So the first question that I'm going to jump to, the one that's been upvoted the most is from Eliana. And she asks, are the content updates visible for translators in the TMS or they need to go through the whole content in order to identify the new updated bits of text and translate them accordingly? Well, uh, I believe anymore in TMS, whenever they, uh, there is a uh, untranslated part of, or, uh, of a document or untranslated document should highlight to you what are the uh, things that you need to focus on. So in SmartCat specifically, you can see a list of documents. You can see the overall translation progress. You can see a translation progress for each individual um, document. And then you can pretty much continue from where you left uh, off and then go through all of the untranslated segments but as you're going through them you will be seeing them you will be just navigating uh, be navigated to them but you will be seeing them in the context of the overall translated page so you get the full context okay. and the second question here the next question is from uh, Yulia and she asks uh, how would it work for UI localization would it be preview based So for UI localization, you are looking into uh, integrating some sort of preview, and it really depends on the technology that you are using. Um, like if you, if you have a like web-based software, uh, it can be translated in a way that you can uh, provide some like in-context translation. That's that's the ideal uh, case if you can do that. For desktop uh, products or for mobile products, you need to install some sort of like SDK or whatever to be able to preview and like associate specific screenshots or screens with with the uh, with the translation. So there are different technologies uh, for okay, that. Cool. Um, Maria Maria Rubio asks: Are there guidelines to quote MT and post editing jobs? Well, uh, I mean, it, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve and uh, the kind of content that you are uh, working on. Some content. Uh, can be like machine translated by default and then like lightly post edited. Uh, if we're talking about some internal documentation, developer documentation, uh, help and center articles. For marketing materials, you want to do uh, some bit of more effort before you're publishing things live. So uh, again, uh, there are no certain guidelines. Uh, I mean, it, it, it depends on uh, your definition of quality and your uh, desire to do things as quickly as possible to deliver things to your clients. So what do your clients want to have? Awesome. Uh, the next question, which has been up for a couple of times from Esther, Esther Kieran. Hi, Esther. Uh, she says, thanks, Igor. For Google Docs, where content teams are often collaborating on different iterations of the source, with people adding comments, changing wording a few times, etc., does this not introduce too much waste? 
That's a great question. Uh, you can set it up. Uh, you can set up a process where you will be publishing things when they are final. If if you want to reduce intermediate edits, in my mind, it's actually great to have people working uh, side by side. That's the beauty of continuous localization and that like two way synchronization where people can work on the content, iterate over that, and then and that is exposed for translation on the TMS side. Yes, uh, if if that's like a completely you know, like like initial versions of the draft that you don't want to send for translation, you just do not publish them in that monitored folder in Google Docs. But once you think that you are, I don't like 90% ready, you can publish that. And with that, you are able to give linguists much more lead time for translation, uh, which is always nice. And also uh, what I uh, noticed in the past with this, with this approach is that linguists can do some QA um, you know, for, for the content. So copywriters might be you know, like deeply focused on providing a proper text for like English speaking or like US market. And then they publish this like almost, uh, almost ready uh, thing for translation. Mm -hmm. And then some linguists say that, by the way, this thing completely doesn't work for the audience in, in Spanish, for example, it just doesn't make sense. And this quick feedback look allows to quickly, like even before the, the content is finalized, it allows uh, content creators to quickly iterate on the source content as well. And this is like really, really nice. Cool. Um, the next question I'll jump to is from uh, Mikhail Heffer, uh, Mikhail from Lychee. Uh, what type of projects would, oh, the question has just jumped off my screen. There we are. What type of projects would be relevant for this automation? Most clients send files and don't need updates on a regular basis. Well, that's that's the thing. We we see that trend that uh, that our clients that are coming to us and they want to translate websites, they do want to have uh, they want to iterate on websites. This is like the website modern days is is a part of a product. You want to iterate on that. You want to do some A/B testing on different types of content. They want to provide those translations, and this is why we are trying to come up with a solution for that for that problem that we're seeing. Yeah, I think that's very concise. Uh, the, there's a question here from Luis Castro. You mentioned various connectors that you recommend. What are your thoughts on Bitbucket and would you recommend it? I mean, uh, like Bitbucket and any other um, systems that work with Git are like software-based and uh, it's more or less pretty much the same in terms of continuous localization. If you store your content in any version control system, that is the regional source where you store the content and where you can have continuous localization working with that. Being in a Bitbucket or GitHub or any like private Git server, uh, doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Um, again, there's a lot of questions here. So if, you're, if, you're, if your question hasn't been answered, do check out SmartCat's poster in the week. We're gonna keep going for a couple of more minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll eat into your break time because there's some great questions here. Martin asks, how do you think the continuous localization fits with the current needs of many vendors of minimum rates? Uh, that's a good question because uh, continuous localization is something that is driven by clients. They want content to be delivered fast. If a vendor works in a in a world where every single translation job has a like minimal size and you know like some some fees associated to that, that doesn't fit into the proper scalable continuous localization process, and this becomes that limiting factor of uh, uh, translation based uh, translation job based uh, approaches. So, I would just like if you are on the vendor side, I would try to explore how you can work with the TMS that you are currently working in that like true continuous localization approach where you have a single project where you get all the like one never ending job essentially. And you just uh, cut off that on a regular basis, like every two weeks or every month, you are just saying that we translated that number of uh, strings in that project. So that's the like the monthly quote for that project or a set of projects. But if you are if you are able to do that, that you will unlock that continuous localization for your clients. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to ask just one more question because we are eating into the break time. Uh, it, well, it's actually two questions from N. Libitina. 
Uh, I'm going to pronounce it that way. I don't know if that's what it is, but these, uh, does it work with software? Uh, and also, how does it work with multiple translators working on the same project? Which of them gets paid for repetitions and 100% matches? Yeah, so first of all, continuous localization originated from localizing software. This was uh, the initial implementation and, and need for, uh, for development teams. So that perfectly works with software. You are storing your strings in a version control system instead of a CMS, but everything else applies there. If you just go back to my slides and instead of CMS, uh, look at that as a repository with resource files, that would be it, that would be it for, um, for software. When it comes to uh, working, uh, multiple people working in parallel on a single project, it depends on the abilities of the translation management platform. For SmartCat specifically, we do allow multiple people working collaboratively online on the same project. And everybody, like whenever somebody goes into one segment, they can like lock that for themselves and they provide translation, they get bad paid for that specific segment. So multiple people can go uh, side by side and um, like close like all the uh, provide the translations for all the missing uh, missing segments in the um, in the file. Okay, cool. Uh, I am going to speed through the last couple of questions. And again, if you want to provide more elaborate answers, we'll do it through the SmartCat channels next week. Uh, Dolores has asked, "Do you believe that the linguist of the future will need more tools to localize and transcreate, or technology will do most of it?" And I'll give you another question while you're thinking about that one. Josevi has asked, which system do you recommend? So we'll finish with those two questions. Uh, I believe with uh, the development of machine translation, most of the content will be going uh, lightly post-edited or not post-edited at all. But for transcreation specifically, this is where the linguist will be focusing on. So it will give more time to provide like the baseline translation for everything. But then uh, linguists will be focusing on most important content and will be uh, providing like really quality translations, which in turn will help you know, like improve the, the automated translation system. As for recommendations, well, I work at SmartCat, so that's, that's the gonna, system that I can recommend. I was going to say, that's, I, I, I set that... you up, you can just knock that one out the park. <laughs> SmartCat, obviously. <laughs> Please don't screen capture that and put that out anywhere. I don't work for SmartCat myself. But anyway, uh, Igor, thank you very, very much for your presentation. There are lots of questions that you're going to have to dive into in the chat. Um, would you like to uh, announce your winner of the book? Uh, and again, the book is, um, it is The Language of Global Marketing, Translate Your Domestic Strategies into International Sales and Profit. Yeah, uh, I like the question about like this Google Doc connector and uh, about how to collaboratively work on source content and, and uh, translations. So I don't remember who was I'm the looking back behind, through that the again. Question. Ah, I can't see it. Um... Andrew, no worries. We will find it later. No worries. No problem. Awesome. Yeah, we sure. will get in contact as soon as we figured out who asked that question. And uh, we, will let, we will let you know that you are getting a book. Igor, thank you very much for your time. Thank Esther, you very much for your Esther says that it was her. Ah, Esther. Esther. Awesome. Yes. Esther Curiel, congratulations. Okay. Uh, there is a book on its way to you.